Rings of Power is finally here, and the marketing designed to prepare you for its launch is definitely taking a different tack than before. I mean, we started talking about adaptations. That moved on to just being loosely based on Lord of the Rings. And the final end point is Elijah who? These are the amazing new stars of Lord of the Rings. I like turtles. Yeah, you'll forget everything you came from, everything that existed before, because the new thing is just so amazing, you can't help but love it. There's long been an attitude among various different Tolkien academics and the cast members of the show themselves that Tolkien was, he was actually wrong. His ideas are old, they're antiquated, and they need to change. This represents an acknowledgement of where we have been and a will to get to where we need to be. That you're not just going to forget who these people are because this show's great, but it's going to be a moral good if you actually do so. And I think there's an interesting question here to look at, was to take into account not only why they've changed something, but given their own reasons for changing it in the first place, have they even achieved their own goals when they go and change things in IPs? Because it's not the only one. This is the LA Times asking, why do you even care if law is changed in the first place? Because right from the start, we knew that Rings of Power was going to be taking Tolkien's world and just rampantly changing it for their own desires. Yeah, they spoke about an adaptation, but they said it needed to reflect what the world actually looks like. And interestingly brought up that they wanted to leave the isolation of their own cultures and come together, which is also a topic of the LA Times article. But at first, the showrunners were determined to try and convince people that this was still Tolkien, despite their own lying eyes telling them that it wasn't. They'd talk about how the story came from a place that wasn't them, that they were just custodians and stewards of it, so that the ideas weren't theirs. But over time, that kind of sense changed. And while they push back a bit by saying, I want to sort of quibble with being vaguely connected because we don't feel that way, they didn't actually offer up any kind of evidence or proof of the statement. It was just all about their feelings, and they didn't even really quibble with it. We just sort of quibbled with it. There was no fire there, no passion, because they knew that their arguments had already been defeated. That marketing had failed. And everybody knew it, even the corporate media that has been defending this thing right from the start, are now just going, hey, that's Gandalf, right? I mean, he isn't confirmed to be Gandalf, but come on. It probably is, right? They even say that Gandalf and the other wizards don't show up for another thousand years. But at this point, who cares? When you alter so much that it's no longer the original IP, what is another little change? Why would they care if they added in Gandalf? They've already changed everything else. Is anyone going to defend Rings of Power by going, oh no, they're not going to do that? that would break the law. No, because we already know that that doesn't matter to them. What this article does is reveal the expectations which Rings of Power has already set in its audience with its new marketing. Everyone has accepted that this is going to change the law. And at this point, it's just about trying to convince people that that's a good thing. But the idea that we've changed something, we've created something new, and we will make you forget what came before is an interesting one because you have to ask, why do you want me to? What is it about Tolkien's world that was wrong? Why do you want me to forget culture and heritage, those ideas that came before, which you don't really hear about anymore? Because one of the things which is definitely going to be changing in Rings of Power, and you can tell this by the way that the cast have been talking about the show, is uh, what's going to be happening to the guys? Because apparently we can learn a lot from Tolkien's vision of masculinity. You know, I remember in Lord of the Rings where everyone actually went out to battle and fought and defended and died for their families. It was typical masculinity at its time. It was about doing your duty. It was about protecting people, sacrificing people, providing for people, defending the people who couldn't defend themselves. It was the guys on the wall and the women and children that were retreating into the caves to try and get away to safety. But apparently... That's not what we took from Tolkien, because we start off with Ishmael going, I think that elves have a lot of feminine energy in their posture and sensibilities. Like what, do you think standing up straight and not going around swearing at people is obviously feminine energy? Like, what? I mean, honestly, I genuinely don't even know what you're referring to with this. But he does go, as I was playing a warrior, that sent me to what we think as masculine energy. And that allowed me to see a tug of war about whether he's meant to be a soldier versus what he's allowed to feel. You see, according to these actors, when you start to have feelings, that's actually not what men have. It's like they've never met men in real life before. The entire thing seems to be written by people that think that men are just emotionless drones. The only thing they can do is have a fight down the pub. 
like seriously but apparently in the show we're gonna get to see ishmael struggle between being both of them at the same time in the show that'll be fun but the worst thing comes from halbrand himself now when it comes to halbrand i don't think anyone finds it difficult to guess who he is but as we just look at the main cast members on show, and bearing in mind that it is the current year, I would have to say, if one of the cast was going to be evil, which one do you think it was going to be? <laughs> can't imagine why, can't even, can't even begin to imagine which one they could possibly have picked. Absolutely all classically traditional ideas going into this show, and you find that when Halbrand is talking about himself, where he says, his character Halbrand is all about what happens to a man who hasn't been loved his whole life? I think often something like power fills that void. Maybe keep an eye on hell, folks. I think we can take that as a yes, he's definitely evil. Because you see, I can guarantee you that people will be calling Galadriel a strong, independent, but most of all, powerful woman. But obviously, when a character like Halbrand, who is, after all, <laughs> just a man, uh, would get power, when a guy would actually ever be able to get and utilize power, obviously that would only result in someone which could be defined as nothing else but evil. I think we'd agree that's not a Tolkienian idea. It's not a classical idea at all. The whole idea that this male energy, this male side would be evil and the feminine side, you know, the one with the elves, the ones are as close to sort of an angelic being as you could get. That's definitely the feminine energy. Hey, maybe that's why Galadriel has a literal halo over her face in the trailer. A deep argument that one side is good, one side is evil, and the only way for the more masculine side to actually be good in the first place is clearly to embrace their feminine side. How very current year. And for the last couple of decades. But with the questions of Arendor and Deza came comments about how you're changing the lore, creating characters that couldn't exist, and just altering the fundamental aspects of the different species throughout the world. It's no longer Tolkien's world. These aren't Tolkien's characters. These are modern day characters crowbarred into his world for your reasons. What are your reasons? And you can debate whether reasons are good or bad. Do they have positives or negatives? But one of the fundamental questions becomes, are you actually successful in what you're trying to do in the first place? Because if you're not even successful in doing it, then why are we just letting you destroy IP after IP in an attempt to? And that is where the LA Times article article comes in. Now, this article is very much in the idea that IPs don't matter and we should just change them, because the argument around characters has always been based on one single foundation. All we want you to do is respect to the law, keep to the canon, and if you are going to create anything new, then it should look and feel and be what the text is. You shouldn't go around changing it, you shouldn't go and think that you can alter this block or this block, because when you do, everything is destroyed. And you can't go, I want a wizard and I want a hobbit and I want a dwarf, and then just bang them together if they don't actually fit in where you're trying to do it. Even if all of the pieces are from the book, it's not a maths equation. The world was created to be a certain way, to look a certain way, and when you alter one of the foundations, everything else comes crumbling down because you can't even predict the knock-on effects. Now, the counter-argument has basically just been, let's insult the people who are coming up with arguments we can't defend ourselves against. Their arguments are reasonable, and so we're just going to insult them, because we don't really have any reasonable, fair, or moral position to take. That's why when someone changes a character, they start saying, this is beyond the pale, how can you not stand me? Even going on to try and claim that the pale referred to boundaries around Ireland, and then going so beyond the pale is essentially racism. I mean, this is for the LA Times, so I don't know if you've ever been to the UK or Ireland, but considering the fact that no one would be able to pick out one from the other in a lineup, your allegation literally doesn't even make any sense. But they do say that if people are annoyed by breaking the law in House of Dragon, then they'll definitely be even more annoyed when they break the law in Rings of Power. Which makes sense, considering the author was involved in breaking the law in one, and he isn't in the other. And I do think that matters. No matter what they change about House of Dragons, I think it's fair play, because, you know, you want to sell out your own IP, I'm not going to be there to defend you for it. But they go on a little rant about how they hate a certain term being used, which generally just means it's effective and so should be used more, and then tried to claim that the different species that Tolkien created, elves, dwarves, humans, hobbits, actually represent different nationalities in the real world. And it's something that the LA Times even recognises, that actually he was a British scholar and this was created as British mythology, and that all of the characters were designed to fit into a British mythology, and so it was built right in. And what you're about to see is the end goal of where we're about to get with the Rings of Power marketing, where we move from 
we're just custodians of Tolkien to, well, okay, we needed to change some things to, well, why does it matter if we change everything? We've already changed it anyway. And it's actually a good thing that we changed it because it was wrong all along. That's why we get that Tolkien lived through two old wars. And because of that, we should just destroy his work. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. That's the argument. The reason why we should just change Tolkien's books is because despite how he wrote them and intended them and actually published them, um, he was also in two world wars. Yeah, apparently you can't argue allegiance to the original work when you're clearly missing its main message. That actually, it's an allegory for the world wars and that elves, dwarves, humans, and harfoots were actually the different people involved in the wars? I think that's what they're trying to say. I mean, honestly, the author is desperately trying to rub two brain cells together and create a spark. It's very quite difficult to follow, even though it's an extremely short piece of an article. We literally go from admitting why it was created to, yeah, but he was in two world wars, and so we should just change all of it. And if you disagree, you're actually the one who doesn't understand what he's saying, even though he's written numerous letters describing his exact intention for writing it in the first place. But don't worry, because if you feel like you're losing brain cells or about to have an aneurysm, it does get worse. Because you see, as many others have pointed out, neither works are historical. And so if the world fantasy doesn't offer enough freedom to play around with how things and people look or sound, then the word adapted should. I think I've seen this defense before, but essentially, because it's fantasy, you could just do whatever you want. I know there is a canon that was written down and standardized and was created to be a holistic piece of work that wasn't intended to be changed by anyone else but himself. But have you considered that it's fantasy? And so, look, if I want to go on Rings of Power wearing a Rolex and driving a Ferrari, it's fantasy. What are you getting annoyed about? Tolkien didn't explicitly say that Ferraris weren't in Lord of the Rings. Tolkien doesn't say anything about, about uh, Harfoot's not having done anything amazing in the Second Age. He says that, that Hobbits before the Third Age didn't do anything impressive. So we felt we had license there to, to, uh, to go ahead and tell a good Harfoot story. And if you think that's not enough, then saying it's an adaptation should. Obviously, when we do adaptations, we can just immediately pick up the book, burn it, and write whatever we want because it's an adaptation. Even though we no longer use that word and we use the word based on instead. Because you see, he'd argue that they easily could have changed more of the characters. And I mean, they could have easily changed more of the characters. But generally, you don't change the characters out of respect. And apparently, because someone was wrong once when it came to the Hunger Games, that just means that you're probably wrong about everything, even the ones where you want and you can actually prove it. This is meant to be the LA Times. You would have thought that their journalists would have had some kind of base level of interview to see if they can even form an argument before they write a piece. But apparently, no. Someone said something wrong once is an argument that's good enough to publish nowadays. No one is saying casting should be random, but calls for authentically casting people is in no way analogous to the protest. You can't authentically cast someone who shouldn't be in the role because they didn't exist in the universe. For exactly the same reason that you can't get a T-Rex to play a dwarf. The whole point of adaptations is to bring a glorious story to life in a new way, to celebrate its timelessness and deliver it to a new audience. And so, if you want to celebrate its timelessness, why are you putting modern ideas into it when traditional ones are by definition timeless? That's why they're old and survived into the modern times. There's a reason why if you go back thousands of years, you'll still find stories about men sacrificing themselves for their family and doing duty and providing for people because that's integral to what it means to be a man. That is a timeless story compared to, oh, I think we need to change all the characters in it just because it looks like our world now. That's a specifically timed modern idea. That's that isn't a classic one. And it gets stranger when the writer seems to actually understand the argument and realize he's incorrect and then just goes, ah, it doesn't matter though, does it? Because there is an argument to be made about internal continuity that yes, all the law should actually make sense. But honestly, is that a wormhole worth following? I don't know. Should an IP actually make sense? Should a story make sense? Should everything fit together and look correct and actually resemble the world that it's meant to resemble? Are you actually meant to be absorbed and immersed into a world or is it just going to be a random mess of things that don't really fit or make any sense but are just there anyway? Are we going to be going through medieval times and see a microwave on the side and expect to think that fits? Are we going to have a hobbit pull a cart around with square wheels while the one next to him drives a Ford truck? Is that okay? Is that a wormhole worth following? Apparently, no because it's fictional. Yes, they have just argued that we should put Ferraris and Ford trucks into Lord of the Rings because it's fiction. So what does it matter? The trick to any successful adaptation is to stay true to the spirit of the original. 
but if you're not trying to expand the story in some way, why bother? I don't know. Why was the Lord of the Rings trilogy made? It was made because the story existed in book form, and they wanted to adapt it to another medium. It had nothing to do with expanding the story. That wasn't the intention behind it. That wasn't the reason why it was made. To adapt something means to transfer it across mediums. It doesn't mean just make it up. Saying that you have to add something as a writer because otherwise you as a writer would go insane. Tolkien fans hate Rings of Power. What the hell? Maybe it's because it's changing. But as a writer, it, you'd go crazy if you didn't change it somehow. It's arrogant, egotistical, and selfish. You're putting you, your desires, your wants and needs above the audience and the original author of the work itself. A lot. Like the actors who say that things need to be changed. Why? Why do you want Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings actually to be changed? Well, it's because we need more roles. We need more roles that I can be in. It's all about me, you see. I couldn't be in Lord of the Rings, but now I can. Now there's a place for me so that I can get more money. Sure, you can talk about how it's big and impressive and you're changing the world and we must do it. It's to be part of a redress of balance within this world. Um is an honor but at the end of the day it's just about you getting a paycheck you couldn't be in it before because it was sticking to what the law was meant to be and so you instead thought no that makes it wrong because i can't be in it i can't get paid i can't get mine quite frankly i can't think of a more arrogant egotistical and selfish reason myself it's pushed forth as something that's meant to be great and beneficial and on the moral high ground but really it's very base isn't it it's just about greed it's just about you. It is everything for um, people of colour. It is everything to progress forward in the film and television industry. To be doing something of this scale and to be um, positioned. Um... At the end of the day, all you want is a position that allows you to get an extra paycheck. And you're going to slander and throw slurs at everyone else until you can get it. Well, all everyone else wants is just them to stick to the actual law, not have their properties destroyed and changed. Because they love the IP how it is, unique, specific, different. They don't want it changed with your modern ideas that just make it all exactly the same as everything else. These messages are being eradicated, and the question is why? Because no matter how much we love our classics, there's no denying that most of them are written in a time when people and stories dominated the cultural narrative. That there were different ideas and traditions that were passed down from this time, and that moving forward, we need to expand our definition of classic and touchstone to include all of the worlds that exist, and that expansion must include reimagining the beloved works. In case you didn't catch that, they are literally arguing that the definition of classic includes new, reimagined, modern pieces of work, which are, by definition, not classic. We now have to include in the definition of traditional work, new, changed works which that had nothing to do with the originals at all. They want to make it so it's impossible to think of Lord of the Rings without the Rings of Power. Because back then, those stories were created in a time that was wrong. The ideas in them are awful, and that is why it must be changed. We must go through and change not just Rings of Power. This is about all fantasy and stories in general. Because any attempt to make our storytelling better, they say, is to use the actual world, to use those myths to discover universal truths. Stories, like everything else on this planet, must change to survive. Sounds almost like a threat, doesn't it? That if we want to keep hold of these stories, they must look and feel different too. To which I ask, what are you gonna do? Ban them? Get rid of them? Burn them? If their ideas don't fit what your new ones are, if their ideas are too much of an abomination for you to consider of still existing, if they don't change, why wouldn't they survive? Why do they have to change for you? Because if you're expressing that you must respect the original material, then you should remember what happened to those original characters, because it wasn't good. Seems like a really nice person, this author, don't you think? But this article does use House of Dragon and Rings of Power just as two launching off points. They're talking about fantasy and stories in general. But the thing is, if you're doing this to everything, then why are you doing it at all? Because they say it's to reflect the real world, to discover universal truths. And the question is, do they really exist? Because right now what we have is entertainment from many different countries and 
it looks different. It's unique. It's specific to the place where it's created. Americans make stuff with American culture and American ideas. And then you've got Koreans making their own stuff with all their kind of traditions and morals and stories that they've made and they've developed over centuries. It's stories, ideas, messages that were passed down from one generation to the next via what they created and the stories that they told to their children. And that led to different people, unique people around the world who all had different beliefs and ideas and traditions. There were no universal truths because everyone was different. Everyone was an individual. What you had is diversity. Every nation was different. Every culture was different. You can look at the world and there's a huge variety of people and entertainment and ideas. It's not universal. And yet that is what this author wishes to create. Something which is universal. Something which everyone is. They want every piece of entertainment, every story to be rewritten, to be redefined to be included with modern ideas, these new universal truths where everything's the same, all of them have the exact same messaging, the exact same people, the exact same ideas, through every story, every piece of entertainment, every IP. They want it all to look the same, all to look universal, no matter where it's created, anywhere on Earth. Whereas now we have a variety of things made by different people with different ideas, they want one. And what you'll create isn't different or unique or interesting. It'll be boring. It'll be monotonous. It'll be the same. It'll just be a, a grey sludge, completely inseparable from anything else. No matter where you go anywhere on Earth, no matter who makes everything, everything will have the same selection of people in because it'll all resemble the world rather than the specific area it was created. When I go to Japan, I want to try Japanese food. I want to get immersed in Japanese culture. I don't want to go and eat a burger. It defeats the purpose of going to a different culture in the first place if everything is the same. And so what you end up with is a paradox. In the idea of exactly what you say you're trying to create, you eradicate it. By in this going in the search for diversity, by making every show look the same, by obeying the checklist, the eradication of old ideas for the replacement of new ones, all you end up with is everything not looking different, not having a variety of entertainment, everything is absolutely identical. That's why when people look at Rings of Power, they don't say, well, that looks like Tolkien. When people look at the Wheel of Time TV show, it doesn't resemble Wheel of Time. None of this feels like the original IP, but it all feels the same. It all feels like generic fantasy because nothing is different. Nothing is specific. Nothing is identifiable as the actual piece of work it's meant to be or from the location that it's meant to be placed in because everywhere is the same. Wheel of Time had a town where people hadn't visited it in thousands of years and yet it could have been London Airport. That's why I can't take Lenny Henry seriously when he says that actually I applaud them moving away from Tolkien's characters in order to just make up new ones where I can get roles because it's all about him. He doesn't care about Tolkien, he doesn't care about the story, he doesn't even care whether it looks or feels like Rings of Power. The only thing he cares about is getting a payday, getting that extra paycheck. It's right what we're doing, it's necessary what we're doing, because my bank balance increases. Arrogant, egotistical, and selfish. Tolkien's work, ideas, and stories proved their value by virtue of their existence. They were made and they sold. Everyone voted independently with their own wallets that these were good, but the simple fact that they have existed for so long and are still loved this long proves that the ideas contained within them are timeless. That they are good ideas. Can we honestly say that anyone caring about Lenny Henry's bank balance will also survive the test of time? And is one worth the destruction of the other? Deadline, who still call Harfoot's proto-hobbits, I don't think they're ever going to live that one down. That's to do with it being in the 21st century. You see, it's the current year, folks. It's the current year, and so obviously we must destroy everything that came before because we know better now. I know better now. I exist now, and that means I know way more than everyone else who's ever existed throughout all of history. Look, I've been called to know it all a lot, but even I wouldn't try and claim that card. People want to see themselves. It's all about them. If only we could appeal to the selfish, egotistical narcissists. That is the big demographic that everyone wants to capture nowadays. And I can't help thinking, you're kind of projecting, aren't you? You weren't happy until you were in the work because you got paid, and you just assume that everyone else is just like that. When no, everyone else, they actually care about other things, external to themselves. It's generally called being a nice human being. Of course, if you go back, there's going to be that thing that prevails because the books don't say it. 
So he already knows that he actually breaks the law, but he doesn't care because that was then and this is now and this is the story we're telling. And we're gonna tell it and whether you like it or not, we don't care, so piss off, is essentially the message. Look, I'm sorry if you don't like it, but we're doing this anyway because it's big budget and I got paid, so bye! Like I said, I've kind of been arguing for quite a while. I don't think actors should be talking to the press because they hate their audience. And I think that summarizes the grand total of why all of this is happening in the first place. It's a lot about me. It's all about I need to get mine. I need roles for me to exist. And so I'm going to campaign for those roles to exist. And if that comes at the cost of beloved classic works made by authors who are no longer around to defend themselves, then, well, that's just a price that I'm willing to pay. And even though they feel like a tool to be used, they're still gonna campaign for it because it gets them more money, it gets them more roles. Meanwhile, the other side, they have a different idea. They want to expand definition of classic to include everything new. They want to discover universal truths that actually reflect the whole world. They want everything to look like this new universal truth, this new universal world. Nothing should be unique anymore. Nothing should be identifiable as the place where it was made, the place where it came from, the stories, traditions, and values which are inherent to each nation. All of that is wrong, because they know it to be diverse, and it's not what they want. There is nothing diverse about universal anything. That's just an unidentifiable blob. Everything's identical, everything's rote, everything's produced off a conveyor belt. It's easy. For the entertainment companies, that is the best thing to do. All you have to do is come out with a maths equation, pick out various different things, run it along the conveyor belt, and out comes another product for everyone to watch. Every piece of entertainment, every IP, is changed in exactly the same way, and it results in exactly the same product. That's why I've seen so many characters before, seen so many of these stories before, for years, and it's why I'm bored. And it's why I don't want any of this to happen. I like unique things. I like things being different. I like the ability to go to a different place and be absorbed, immersed in a different world. And you can't do that when everything looks the same, when everything looks universal. What you end up with is just an IP that could be any other IP. Everything is generic. And that, most certainly, isn't Tolkien. But it is Rings of Power. We changed it because Tolkien's ideas were wrong. They were classical. They were made to be a specific thing for a specific location. They were meant to be identifiably British. We can't have that. That's not very universal, is it? That's not very 21st century. And yet, those identifiable values, that specific place it came from, is exactly what was integral to the world. Those are the, the culture, the values which are inherent to the piece. And if you remove them, then it's not Tolkien anymore and it's not Lord of the Rings. And that is the problem that Rings of Power has. By removing the fundamental values, by making it something that could be anywhere, you've made it not the thing that it was at all. It's just another part of the generic sludge that won't mean anything to anyone because no one will attach value to your thing that they attached to the original thing, despite that being the fact that you bought it in the first place. So roll on Friday and Rings of Power, and we'll get to see whose set of ideas are actually correct. Tolkien's or yours. Well, for now, that's it from me. Those are just my thoughts. Let me know yours down in the comments below. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe. More videos like this in the future. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.